Hello and welcome. I'm Pater Nues Makel. This is Rappler Talk. With us today is one of the world's leading experts on the South China Sea. His name is Gregory Poling. He's from the Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative. He's the director of the organization. He's in the Philippines for two days. And we're lucky to have him with us today to talk about the West Philippine Sea and the Benham Rise and other issues in the region. Thank you very much for joining us, Greg. Uh, thank you, Paterno. Greg, I'd like to begin by asking you to give us a brief backgrounder of the West Philippine Sea right now. So what's happening now in the West Philippine Sea, South China Sea? Well, so I think we have two competing dynamics happening right now. On the one hand, we have this diplomatic outreach led by, by Manila in particular, but you know, involving all Southeast Asia, and efforts to negotiate a code of conduct. And the big question, of course, is uh, when, when the negotiators next meet in March in Hanoi, are we going to see real progress building on what was a pretty uh, weak one-page framework last year, uh, or will this be a delaying tactic from China? And then on the other side, we have these uh, regular stories coming out showing that the Chinese continue to build up military facilities on their artificial islands. Uh, they continue to engage in what I think we should consider coercive behavior, you know, for instance, uh, threatening to use force against the Vietnamese if mm -hmm. they don't, uh, if they hadn't halted oil and gas drilling in disputed waters, things like that. And so it's hard to it's hard to uh, see how these two different narratives come together, right? On the one hand, is China a bully? Is it militarized in the South China Sea, or is it seeking a diplomatic solution? So, in a recent article, you mentioned two recent um, uh, issues in the South China Sea. One happened in. Uh, on December 30, 2017, and uh, another January 17 this year. Can you talk to us briefly about uh, these two uh, uh, events or um, sure. incidents in the South China Sea? So on December 30th, what we had was a Chinese state television broadcast a video that was taken from a plane coming into land at its, its military airfield on Fiery Cross Reef. And it, it was the first time that we really saw a close-up image of the entirety of, of the reef like that. There have been camera crews from China that have gone before and shown you individual buildings, but it really, it brought home in a, in a really, you know, uh, gut-wrenching way just how much military infrastructure they've built at this island, even as we've had the, the diplomatic game playing out under the Duterte government. And it resulted in, in an, uh, a pretty heated debate here in Manila where you had Delphine Lorenzana come out and say that this was unacceptable and it's true that he would ask the BFA to issue uh, diplomatic uh, warnings or a diplomatic uh, 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 protest to Beijing. And yet you then had the palace and, and Hiroki come out and say, no, it's fine. The Chinese can build whatever they want on the island. There's no, mm -hmm. nothing to see here. Mm -hmm. uh, and then uh, not long after, you had a US freedom of navigation operation go within 12 nautical miles of Scarborough Shoal that provoked the same debate again. Hiroki said, it's got nothing to do with us. And Lorenzana said, the Americans have every right to do this. And in the fiery cross reef uh, issue, uh, Harry Rock has said that China was acting in good faith, right? Right, and so this, this is not the first time we've heard that term used by the palace, but it was particularly weird here. Uh, what, he basi what he said was, as long as the Chinese don't uh, undertake new island building, as long as they don't build on, on any new f features, they're acting in good faith. And so the implication was that the Chinese can do anything absolutely anything. They could land fighter jets, they can do whatever they want at the seven artificial islands they already have, as long as they don't undertake new reclamation at, at one of the new islands or at Scarborough Shoal. And as far as I know, that was never, nobody ever agreed to that. That's never been the, the arrangement here, that the Chinese can do anything they want as long as they don't engage in new reclamation. So in your recent article, you asked, is China acting in good faith? So now I will ask you that question. Is China acting in good faith? No. No, so there is, if, the, if we are being cynical, the evidence suggests that the Chinese are just delaying, that the code of conduct process, all of this diplomatic outreach to the Duterte government is meant to avoid criticism from the neighborhood while the Chinese finish all of this island building, finish consolidating their position. Uh, and that sooner or later they're going to return to a more aggressive posture because they have no intention of signing a COC. Why would they? Why would they sign a code of conduct when they are winning day by day and they're getting what they want? The more um, charitable interpretation is that maybe there are some people in Beijing who think that the code of conduct is worth it, but there must be a lot more people arguing that it's not because they continue to build this military infrastructure. Oh. 
What about the Scarborough Shoal incident? Uh, how would you react to that? You mean the freedom of navigation operation? Yeah. So, uh, what was telling here was that a couple things. For the first time, it was the Chinese who made public the fact that there was a FANOP, right? No U.S. official and no U.S. media outlet mentioned this FANOP. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Beijing issued the complaint first. Mm -hmm. um, what that suggests to me is that, one, there's probably been some more under the Trump team that we don't know about. Before uh, anything else, yeah. um, Greg, can you explain to our viewers what a FANOP is? Sorry, so a, a FANOP is uh, an action, it's an operation undertaken by the U.S. military as part of the Freedom of Navigation program. And the Freedom of Navigation program has been around since the Carter administration. It's over 40 years old now. It's a joint program from the State Department and the DOD, the Defense Department, in which basically lawyers at the State Department analyze foreign laws when it comes to maritime rights and decide if they are infringing on, on the U.S. rights or if they're considered illegal. If they determine that, they'll make diplomatic representations and ask countries to clarify their laws or bring it into accordance with international law. And if those countries refuse, then you undertake FANOPs. And mm -hmm. FANOPs are meant to establish a record of U.S. non-compliance. So it's a way of saying the U.S. doesn't recognize this law that you've made and is not going to abide by it. In this case, what it was meant to do which shows the U.S. does not recognize the Chinese demand for prior notification before foreign vessels can pass through their territorial sea. And uh, you were saying a while ago that uh, no one knew that there was uh, this kind of uh, FON op. Right, so the problem with the FON program, with the FON ops, was that from late 2015 until at least early last year, they had become a media circus. And so, like I said, the program's been going on for 40 years, and nobody outside of of lawyers in the Pentagon ever n really cared about it. Uh, in late 2015, with this, starting with a Fana Pasubi Reef, all of a sudden every single one became overanalyzed and it became a media circus and it became a black eye for the Chinese. And it also became a test of U.S. commitment to the region in this broad way that it was never meant to do. This is a very narrow legal program and, and frankly nobody should care about it. What the Trump administration seems to want to do is get back to that. So they're doing these operations more frequently, every six weeks or so, and they're doing them quietly. They're not talking about them unless the Chinese complain. And in this case, the Chinese complain the Chinese is the complained. only reason anybody knows that it happened. And uh, the Chinese complained, and uh, Harry Roque, the presidential spokesman in the Philippines, said it is an issue between the U.S. and China alone. How would you react to this statement? Here is the problem. Does the Philippines claim Scarborough as Philippine territory? If the answer is yes, then that FANOP happened in the Philippine Territorial Sea. And so it should be Manila saying whether or not they have a problem with it. And this is what Delphine Lorenzana did with his statement. So he didn't say whether or not he likes U.S. FANOPs. He said the Americans have a right to sail through uh, the Territorial Sea as long as it's an innocent passage. Because it's the Philippine Territorial Sea as far as Manila is concerned. Roque's statement saying that this is an issue between Beijing and Washington. Is it right to say that? Certainly. Under international law, nothing prohibits, uh, well, the international law is very clear. The UN Convention on Law of the Sea, among other, other bits of customary international law, say that foreign ships have a right to pass your territorial sea as long as they engage in what's called innocent passage, which means they go from point A to point B, and they don't do anything in between. This is what that ship did. The Chinese objected that. The Philippines doesn't. Under Philippine domestic law, foreign ships do this all the time. And so what Lorenzano was doing was establishing that, uh, in his eyes, this is the Philippines' territorial sea, not China's, and that the Philippines is saying, yeah, of course, the U.S. warships can pass through it as long as they're doing it quickly in Innocent Passage. Roque, on the other hand, said, we don't have anything to do with this, which implies that the Philippines doesn't have a position on what happens in its own territorial sea around Scarborough Shoal. That was the problem. So as an expert, an outsider looking in, how did you react to this uh, statement of Harry Roque? What was the first thing that uh, entered your mind? That it was typical. That this is, we've seen this debate play out between two camps within the Duterte government on every issue related to the South China Sea for the last year and a half. And on one side is Lorenzana and the Department of National Defense and the, and the Armed Forces. And on the other side are Roque and Cayetano and the group who want to please Beijing no matter what the cost. Um, and who think, in their credit, they're not just doing it because they're pro-Beijing, they're doing it because they think that they'll be rewarded with a code of conduct and Chinese economic incentives. And the Lorenzana guys, as I said, are looking at facts on the ground and don't see any evidence that the Chinese actually want a diplomatic solution. 
So you're saying that, that there's this uh, disconnect between uh, two camps in the yeah. government? And I think it boils down to an interpretation of China's intentions. If you believe that the Chinese are willing to sign a code of conduct, then you'd have reasons to want to not upset them no matter what. But if you believe that you know, continued building of military outposts within the Philippine EEZ is a sign that the Chinese aren't serious, aren't negotiating in good faith, then like Lorenzana, you would want to take a stronger stand, prepare for the possibility that the Chinese are going to return to a more aggressive posture. Recently, uh, the hottest issue in the Philippines uh, when it comes to foreign affairs is the issue in Ben Ham Rise. Mm -hmm. So how would you comment on uh, what's happening now in, in Ben Ham Rise? How does it fit in what you see as uh, China's agenda? So China's um, stated naval uh, strategy is to make sure that it can get outside of what it calls the first island chain, which mm -hmm. is the, uh, you know, China, when you look at it geographically, China is ringed by the set of islands stretching from the Japanese islands down through Guam and the Philippines and all the way around Indonesia. And so it's difficult for, for Chinese submarines, for instance, to get out into the wider Pacific. Mm -hmm. A place like Benham Rise is key to this strategy, where China needs to make sure that it can get out through various straits in Southeast Asia and Northeast Asia into the Western Pacific and prevent itself from being boxed in. And so when it's doing things like seabed surveys or bathymetric surveys, which it has increased the, hugely the number of surveys that it's doing all around Asia, in places like Benham Rise, it is reasonable for governments to think that there might be a military purpose, that it's not pure science. Mm -hmm. And uh, is there a connection between uh, what's chi what China is doing in Benham Rise and what it's doing in the West Philippine Sea? If it's engaging in, in survey activities um, you know, without prior permission or against international law, then yeah, we're seeing the same kind of challenges to the regime of international law that China itself helped negotiate and sign on to. On the military side, it's certainly part of the same effort for the PLAN to make sh PLA Navy to make sure that it can operate as a true blue water navy for the first time and push the Americans and allies like the Japanese and the Australians out of, of this first island chain. You know, make sure that, that they're not right up against the, the Chinese coast. So overall, how would you assess the Duterte administration's approach towards the South China Sea, the West Philippine Sea? Um, I think well-intentioned but naive is the best way to describe it. There's nothing wrong with pursuing diplomatic outreach to China. There's nothing wrong with pursuing a code of conduct. The problem is that there doesn't seem to be much being done in case that's not going to work. You know, so if the Chinese aren't serious, if they decide to start putting fighter jets on the Spratleys and harassing Filipino fishermen and oil and gas and Coast Guard, if they re-blockade the Marines on the Sierra Madre, what is the plan B? What is the Duterte government going to do about it? And they're not taking any steps to prepare for that possibility. In fact, they've rolled back a lot of things like st the strength of the U.S. Philippine alliance that have acted as a deterrent against Chinese aggression in the past. Why do you call it naive? Because the facts on the ground don't support the notion that China's acting in good faith. You know, if a bully keeps punching you over and over and over, it is naive to think he's all of a sudden going to stop and, and behave nicely. Now, sure, people change and countries' intentions can change, and maybe the Chinese really do want a negotiated settlement here but I don't see any evidence of it. And clearly the Department of National Defense doesn't see much evidence of it, and the AFP doesn't see much evidence of it because they keep pushing back against all of these Chinese activities. But uh, supporters of the president would say they're not being naive, they're being practical, they're being pragmatic, and uh, they don't want to go to war with China. We want our fishermen to be able to fish. So how would you address that kind of uh, feedback? I don't think that's practicality. I think that's defeatist. So there, you, you repeatedly hear statements out of uh, the palace and, and supporters of the palace that go something like, well, there's nothing we can do about it because if the Chinese were to attack us, we would lose right away and, and therefore we should just give them whatever they want. That's basically what that boils down to, right? But the only options here are not surrender or war. There is a whole spectrum of ways to impose costs on the Chinese for being bullies and outlaws that we haven't tried yet. Now, I'm not saying that 10, 20 years from now, at some point, we'll decide that the cost isn't worth it and that maybe the Chinese are just determined to get this no matter what. But it's a little early to fly the white flag and surrender now. So if we make noise, what do we get out of it? 
what the Philippines gets out of it is the right to access its own mineral resources, its own fish, and more importantly, the Philippines is not acceding to being part of a China-run Asia for the 21st century that doesn't follow rules and norms. You know, we spent, we as an international community, spent most of the post-World War II decades negotiating this regime of laws and institutions that are supposed to prevent us going back to a great power might, is ma might makes right way of doing business. And now, because the Chinese don't like some of those rules, we have to throw out the whole rule book and go back to, what, a, a concert of great powers where, where China gets to do whatever it wants just because it's bigger than its neighbors? Just echoing again um, the sentiments of uh, President Duterte supporters, yeah. uh, yes, we can make noise, but uh, China won't stop anyway. So wh why do it? Why not just be friendly with China? How do we know China won't stop? Have we really tried to impose serious costs on the Chinese? The, and I'll, I'll, there are, all right. They're more powerful. There are, well, sure, they are more powerful, mm -hmm. but they're not immune to pressure. The Chinese care about their reputation, just like any country. The Chinese are not unique. And I don't, I don't like this premise that of 192 countries in the world, the Chinese are the only ones that can't respond to pressure. They're the only ones that don't care what people think of them. Of course they do. If the Chinese didn't care what the world thought, they wouldn't have spent three years trying to get the Aquino government to drop the arbitral case. They would have just ignored it. And we've seen time and again that on specific instances where, where the Philippines or other claimants have presented the Chinese with a real choice to use force or back off, they backed off. A good example is 2014, when the Chinese blockaded the Marines on the Sierra Madre, and the Filipinos decided to put a bunch of reporters and civilians on a boat and run the blockade with a US P-8 overhead to let China know the world was watching, the Chinese backed off. They could have blown the boat out of the water, but they didn't, because they're not willing to pay that cost. For a country, how important is uh, reputation? I mean, the reputation matters a lot more than we give it credit for. Uh, this is 21st century, and success on the global stage is about getting countries to cooperate with you because they want to, not because you force them to. Uh, the more the Chinese break faith with other countries, the more they're seen as an outlaw, the less likely countries are to want to sign up to Xi Jinping's version of, of China's place in the world. So um, given that, um, why should we uh, speak out against uh, China's aggression? Uh, summing up um, what you said a while ago. Yeah, well, look, so the Philippines, I, no, no, nobody in Asia wants to live in a world, uh, in an Asia, in which China gets its way all the time just because it's the biggest. So if we want to have a 21st century Asia where rules and norms matter and all countries are, are at least notionally equal, we need to start standing up for it here in the South China Sea. This is, in a sense, the first battlefield where it'll be decided what kind of China, uh, you know, what kind of rising power China is going to be. Why do you call it the first battlefield? Because it's the first place where I think Beijing is, is challenging a fundamental principle of international law, which is the equality of states. Either China gets its way because it's big and other states are small, or it doesn't because we are all co-equal countries who agreed to a set of rules. And the Chinese, it's important to remember, helped negotiate on close in the 80s, and they ratified it in 96, and now all of a sudden, just because they have a bigger navy, they've decided the rules don't work for them anymore. And uh, you called it a first battlefield. What role is the Philippines playing in this first battlefield? Unfortunately, the Philippines is a frontline state. It's the first one that China is seeking to roll over. I mean, the Philippines and Vietnam. And so if you accept the Chinese conception of historic rights and the way the system should work, the Philippines no longer has an exclusive economic zone. Uniquely among all the countries of the world, the Philippines and Vietnam no longer have an exclusive economic zone. They have to share every fish they pull out of the South China Sea with China. They have to share every drop of oil and gas with China. That is not the case anywhere else in the world. And why would the Philippines want that to be the, why would the Philippines want it to be the case without a fight at least? So what should the Philippines uh, do? The first thing the Philippines needs to do is start talking about this again uh, in, in the way that it was being talked about a couple years ago, which is a challenge, that China is challenging the system and challenging the rights of its neighbors and stop keeping quiet every time Beijing does something. I, there, China should be rewarded when it does the right thing, when it reaches out diplomatically, but when it does things like build out military outposts in the Philippine EZ or you know, threaten one of the Philippines' neighbors with uh, a, a military attack that did to Vietnam last year, the Philippines should be willing to at least speak up, at least say something. Mm -hmm. The second major thing that needs to be done is we need to get, we need to do a much better job at strengthening the U.S. Philippi or the U.S. The US Philippine alliance so that there's at least a deterrent, right? The, if, if the Chinese do consider force, they have to know that, that there can be 
some cost, some, some deterrent. And, and for the time being, at least, that's going to have to rely on the strength of the U.S.-Philippine alliance. What about the code of conduct in the South China Sea, the negotiations? How do you view uh, this development? There's nothing wrong with the code of conduct negotiations continuing. Let's just be honest about what's going to happen. They're going to drag on for years with no end in sight. And so they're not going to solve any of our immediate problems. Uh, you know, ASEAN and China signed the non-binding declaration on the conduct of parties in 2002. Uh, Fifteen years later, what we got was a one-page outline last year that didn't say anything. It said less than the EOC did, in fact. It, it didn't discuss where it would apply. It didn't talk about how to share fish or oil and gas. And it didn't even agree if it was going to be binding or not. None of the real issues have been talked about. So how useful was it? I don't think it was useful at all. I, I think it was a step backward for ASEAN uh, and for the Philippines. We already had a stronger agreement in 2002. Why did we wait 15 years just to kind of go back in time uh, and, and come up with this document that didn't say anything? There is nothing in the framework that suggests that ASEAN and China are ready to actually negotiate a code of conduct. So should we throw that document away? The Philippines, and I think all the claimants, should accept that it's not going to be the basis for a resolution of the South China Sea dispute anytime soon. There's nothing wrong with continuing the discussion, but there need to be other lines of effort. And right now the problem is that the Code of Conduct is the only game in town. I don't see any evidence that DFA or the Palace are thinking about other options beyond the Code of Conduct. I think they're considering a non-legally binding Code of Conduct. How do you view this? A non-legally binding code of conduct isn't a code of conduct at all. What if is there's, it? If there's, it's, it's nothing. It is a statement of general principles that countries will be free to break. But it's also important to, to, to point out that legally binding or not is not the only problem here. You could have a legally binding document that is so vague it doesn't do any good, right? If you don't have specific agreements, where does it apply, how does it apply, how are we going to do this, then it, legally binding is meaningless. You mentioned in your recent article that the U.S. also has a role to play in this. What do you think should the U.S. do to help resolve this uh, dispute? Yeah, look, the U.S. has a stake in the system, right, in making sure that we don't go back to a pre-World War II way of doing foreign policy in which the Chinese get to tear up any rules they don't like. And so they, we don't, the U.S. doesn't have a position on who's going to control which islands in the South China Sea. It does have a, a position on how the dispute should be solved. And so it is willing to step in and defend Philippine interests as long as they're aligned in, in that effort. One thing the U.S. needs to do is finally give a clarification that the Mutual Defense Treaty applies to Filipino troops in the South China Sea. It's long overdue. Uh, it's very clear in the text that our treaty applies in the South China Sea and, and that we haven't said it publicly has been damaging to, to the Philippines' willingness, I think, to stand to China, and to China's willingness to, to not push too hard, right? So if the China's going to be deterred, they have to believe that the U.S. commitment is credible. And the fact that we haven't said it, um, I think, could lead to, to misinterpretation in Beijing. My last question is uh, for ordinary Filipinos like myself, what are the things that we should watch out for in this issue? So if I'm looking at the next, say, year or two, um, one, one key test of China's resolve, I think, is going to, or China's, China's good faith, as, as Harry Roque likes to say, is going to be, does China send military aircraft to the Spratly Islands? Because if your argument is that the islands only need necessary defense and they're for civilian purposes, and yet you put J-10 or J-11 combat fighters out there, that seems like an offensive capability, and it suggests that maybe you're not serious about the diplomacy after all. Uh, so that's one big step I would be looking at. The other is, what, is, what do the Chinese do when states start trying to access resources in their EEC? When the Filipinos try to drill at Reed Bank if, if a joint development scheme can't come up, what, is, what do the Chinese do about that? Do they use force? Do they use bullying tactics? Or do they accept the rule of law? So I'm not a fisherman. I'm not a soldier. Why should I care about this issue? Uh, well, you know, I can talk about rules and order until I'm blue in the face. I know it's, it's, it's a, um, it seems like an abstract concept. So, so let's talk about one specific example. Uh, we're sitting here in Luzon. The majority of electricity generated in Luzon comes from one single source, the Malampaya gas field, which is going to run out sometime in the next decade. And so unless we think that the Philippines is going to completely kick its, its natural gas habit, 
uh, we need a new source to replace that. And the only one on the table is Reed Bank. So if the Philippines can't access its own oil and gas and its own continental shelf, are we willing to deal with rolling brownouts just to be nice to the Chinese? The, the, this is just one example, but the point is there are real costs here. The reason there is an exclusive economic zone is because countries need to benefit from those economic resources. And the Chinese are basically saying that the Philippines doesn't get that. Thank you very much, Greg, for visiting the Rappler office. We've been speaking with Gregory Poling of AMTI. I'm Paterno S. Makel. Thank you for joining us.